Hey colleagues, a warm welcome from myself. If you just allow us maybe another two minutes because they're just uh, accepting still some people. So maybe let me wait another five minutes and then we'll start. So if I'm looking in my watch, let me start in five minutes time. Thank you. Dear colleagues, a warm welcome to myself. We five minutes past the hour, so I'm gonna start officially and I'm sure afterwards people can look at the uh, YouTube and we will make the video available. But welcome to this webinar. I think it's for us a privilege to host the webinar under the regional private sector group that sits the head office in Kenya and we work under the leadership of Larry and Faith. And uh, Larry was supposed to close off for us today, but unfortunately this emergency and he cannot attend, but that doesn't uh, put our spirit uh, down. We can look forward to what Jakob and Werner have compiled for us. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Jakob because it's nice to have the youngsters around you and Werner and they have done a phenomenal program for us. And I encourage you to maybe send them some questions or some notes notes and it's nice to have young people around us that can show us what they're doing in terms of technology and how can it change the supply chain. So Jakob, I hand over to you and Werner and you can moderate and we look forward to a very nice session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yonita. Uh, Dear colleagues and esteemed guests of the private sector in the region, on behalf of the World Customs Organization, Eastern Southern Africa Regional Private Sector Group, 
We are delighted to host you on this Thursday uh, morning, afternoon, evening, depending where you are. For those of you that do not know me, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jakob van Rensburg, or Jacob in English, if you like, and I am entrusted with coordinating all matters of the regional private sector group. We are once again pleased to host another webinar titled Disruptive Technologies in the ESA region. This is in fact our 13th webinar, and we have an excellent speaker lined up for you today. But before I introduce the speaker, Werner van Nieker, allow me to say something about the topic that we are discussing today. As you all know that technology is ever increasing in our daily lives as it is in business. And to that end, the World Customs Organization in 2019 did a study on disruptive technologies. Now, the study report aims to share some insights into what's regarded as disruptive technologies and to allow customs administrations to reap the benefits of the opportunities they present. And these benefits are also true for trade in our region. And I believe Banner will talk to them today, hence the focus of our webinar here today. So although the word disruptive might have a very negative ring to it, uh, be it as it may, we are actually talking about the natural evolution of technology. Indeed, our lives are being enriched in many aspects by the so-called disruptive technologies. And consequently, I am sure you will find this webinar very enlightening. Before we start, just some house rules for your information. Uh, please mute your microphone and switch off your video. The speaker will be on video while presenting. And then please uh, make sure to uh, make use of the chat function to ask some questions. We have, will have a Q&A question and answer session afterwards. And simultaneously, we will run some polls during the webinar. So please look out for these. And they are completely anonymous. So feel free to give your most honest opinion about them. And any further questions you might have about the regional private sector group, please feel free to contact us. As we uh, welcome more guests to the webinars, it's also worth pointing out, as you need to mention, that uh, the webinar will be recorded and will be set available on our uh, YouTube channel and also on the website. And there are various other resources there on the website. So have a look at those. So please allow me the opportunity to uh, introduce to you our distinguished speaker. Today, we welcome Werner van Niekerk, a director from Maluti X, a supply chain solutions company, which he co-founded in 2018. Now, Maluti X is uh, very active in the digital space and aims to build robust, sustainable solutions, which can deliver real value to its clients. So with that, I hand over to Werner. Thank you for joining us and we hope you will find this webinar very insightful. Werner, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you for that uh, flattering introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm quite excited to, uh, to share the presentation that I've prepared today. It's uh, talking about disruptive technologies is, is something uh, I find both exciting and, and, uh, and challenging. Um, because it plays such a big part in our in our life these days. We know if you if you go on LinkedIn, it's it's probably the first post post you see is something about a disruptive technology. So today I want to zoom in to uh, to be a bit more specific on 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 digitization um, when we're talking about the technology. You know, there's so many. When I was I joined a bit early, and, I, and I'm sure you guys saw that um, that slide that was reeling was um, full of the you know the key buzz terms we we get to see for for the technologies these days. So I, I decided I'd, I'd rather zoom in on something today and and take a look at a practical approach of how we actually go about getting the benefit um, of using the technology. Before we do that, I I would like to to touch on to touch on some definitions, just so we're all in the same place. So, what do we actually mean 
by digitizing a supply chain. And it was interesting when I did some research about a formal definition, there was obviously a lot of people that have had a lot of opinions on this. And I tried to keep it as simple as possible. And this, I think, definition is, is out of my experience, also the one that, that, that holds the most true, is where we use the digital technologies, and this is the big data solutions, the machine learning, blockchain, the IoT, to transform a human-driven process to a software-driven process. And this is where I want to want to take a quick pause because I want to just explain that a bit better. What does it mean to transform a human-driven process to a software-driven process? I think it's easy to make the mistake to assume that this is where a process gets completely taken over by a piece of software, where all the decision making is now done by some complicated black box and there's no human interaction. And, I, and although they there are such in instances, I don't believe that is, that is mostly the case. A practical example of this would be, you know, we're ordering a package online. We're not phoning another human being, explaining what we want, telling them where we live. You know, that would be a human driven process. You know, the web application has allowed us to add to cart, make a payment, fill in your delivery address and, and get a package delivered to your door. That is a, a good example of a software-driven process. So there's still human interaction. The process is just governed um, by some sort of software application. And then the last part, which is almost obvious, but I'd, I'd be so bold to say that in 80% of the definition I found for supply chain digitization, it didn't really touch on it. You know, the definitions normally spoke about how we use digital technology to change something. And I think it's quite important to add the, this third block where we say, well, we are doing it to, to increase efficiency or performance for some reason. You know, we're, we're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. We are, this needs to have an end objective to make someone's life easier or better. Um, which is quite a quite an important point of this, this definition. And secondly, I'd like to touch on what it means to disrupt. Now, Jakob, I got a smile on my face when you when you said, you know, there's there's almost a negative connectivity with the with the name or with the with the term disruption. And and that's very true. If you go Google just the plain definition for disruption, um, you normally get a where they use it in a sentence. I believe that sentence was something like the accident on the road today was a real disruption or, or something like that. So disruption is, is generally a negative word. So I had to go dig it a, a bit deeper and the Cambridge Dictionary actually has a specific definition of disruption in, in the world of business, where it says the action of completely changing the traditional way that an industry or market operates by using new methods or technology. Now, once again, what I found quite interesting about this is that they don't talk about the why. You know, why do we want to change the way we do things? Why do we want to use new technologies? And which is why I, I referred to Clayton Christensen, which is a, a, a Harvard MBA professor, where he has a quite a similar um, definition and it ends it off with, and produces something new and more efficient and worthwhile, which I think is, is once again, it's a very interesting or a very important aspect of disruption is that we actually want to improve. So drawing the parallels between the definition of supply chain digitization and the, the business definition of disruption, we can kind of conclude that by digitizing your supply chain, you can really disrupt your business in a good way, make your business more, more, more efficient, get higher performance. There's new technology being used, there's process transformation, and there's more efficiency. So in theory, it works. But that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to spend time on today is how do we practically get there? 
how do we practically use a disruptive technology? And in this case, it is supply chain, the digitization of a supply chain. How do we practically use that in our businesses to get real value, real value to the business, real efficiency improvement? And I want to do that by presenting three case studies. And these case studies are um, projects where I have been a part of or know of. So the, the first case study is, um, you know, the how not to do it which was a, a project that, that I did very, very early on in my career. Um, the, the second case study is, is a case study that I'm actually quite, quite jealous of because I didn't actually do the project with two of them. My very close uh, co-workers were actually responsible for, for that case study and, and I believe you'll find it extremely insightful. And then the third case study is a, is a pro project that I'm really proud of and in the sense of, that I really think we were busy with the state of the art in this in this project. So now that I'm done with the you know the definitions and the boring stuff, we can we can jump into the the case studies. How I try to summarize these case studies, I'll give you an overview of the client and and what they do and their business like landscape that is applicable. I will explain to you why I was there, or my business was there, what we needed to do. I'll then talk a bit about what the actual outcome is and what we didn't. And then I'll take a few, you know, learnings and stuff that I've really um, found insightful on my journey, especially on using digitization to disrupt the way businesses operate. So this first case study is was a South, South African finished goods storage and distribution business. They were a fa fairly young business, I think, not older than four years at the time, um, with a decent sized footprint. I think over the whole Southern Africa, they had about four warehouses with um, roughly about 35,000 pallet spaces across all the warehouses, which is a uh, you know, significant size. They had a fairly recently implemented WMS software system, um, which was still running on on-premise on service, so it wasn't a web-based web application. And they had a lot of Excel in their business, which I'm very sure everybody here today can kind of nod their heads to and you know, yeah, we know, we know about that. I think we've all seen it. And I don't think this is specific to supply chain or logistics. I think this is, this is across the board. But they have a lot of processes that were governed by the use of Excel as the capturing tool or the governing tool of how they actually execute the process. So to set the scene, we, when we got to the client, they started off with, you know, they have a dedicated person that is spending 40 hours a month just to compile their business reports because that, that person has to go pull reports from the WMA system and then go find some Excel sheet on some server sitting in some folder somewhere and put it into one file and then distribute to the entire business. And this had to happen every single Monday. And I, I had so much sympathy for this lady. She, when I sat with her and went through the report, she told me she, she, she got up every, every morning, every Monday morning at four o'clock, she'd start with this process. Um, Obviously, this led to some questionable report accuracy due to the manual nature. You know, the template she uses normally a date format was year Monday, and then it was this week it was swapped around. So she, because she's a human, tended to start making mistakes because it was just too much work for for for, for a human to do. And then the availability of information was was really bad because she had to compile them, send them out next week. She overwrites what she did the previous week. So it was a, it was a really manual, painful process. To get back to, 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 to the client, the first engagement, and this is quite important for this case study, is when we arrived there, their management team has already decided we need to build a data warehouse to centralize all their data. We need to take some fancy business intelligence tool, 
web based connect to this data and we need to replicate all the reports that this person was manually compiling on this web based tool and automate the refreshing of the information. Now, up until this point, I, this sounds this sounds good. Now this sounds like this is what digitization is. And at the time I also felt that way. But after the conclusion of this, this project, I learned a few crucial lessons. So we built it on premise data warehouse. Um, and we built it on the servers where a lot of the business applications were still running. And it put some strain on those servers. So it, it still required some maintenance and administration from time to time, which kind of ate into the time we were saving. The second point is, is probably the mo most important and is the, the most important to me is that we replicated the, the current reports they had exactly on this, this online um, business intelligence platform, exactly to the team, which means the same people were looking at the same reports that were showing the same numbers as before. And I have an analogy of how I explain this. Let's say you cycle to work every day on a bicycle. No, it takes a bit long. Maybe when it rains, you get a bit wet, you feel a bit cold. Now you get upgraded to a Mercedes. Much more comfortable, you get there a lot quicker, but you end up at the same place. And that is essentially what happened here. We built the Rolls Royce, but we're still only driving to the same place. Nothing has changed in terms of how this company looks at their business and what numbers they are actually using to, to determine what needs to happen. And, and for that reason, I can't classify this instance of digitization as disruption because we automated a small part of their business, but the eventual outcome, the eventual service that they were delivering to a customer did not change because of this. And then the last thought was that although these reports refreshed automatically, a lot of the sources were still pulling from Excel. And we know when a human interacts with Excel, there's, there's going to be issues. You know, there's data validation or data filled in incorrectly. So we had to spend a lot of time kind of fixing the Excel file so that the report would refresh properly. And these are, these are the practical issues that we're actually facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's always easy to talk about the nice shiny BI tool. And in the front, it re looks really impressive. It's the dashboard and it's the graphs and it's drillable and it's, you know, there's graphs moving and it looks really great. But at the back, it's, you know, it's Excel and it's dirty. It's, it's still, there's still someone having to fix it, um, which, which I don't see as the, that is not, the, the, the point of, of, of disruption and digitization. If I look at the key takeaways from, from this case study is that you can't, don't start with the solution, start with the problem. And this is something I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about. And the reason being is that there are so many solutions being thrown in our faces on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we, we hear the words AI and machine learning and blockchain. We hear them every single day. Those are solutions. And I agree they're powerful solutions and they're very useful if we know what we are solving. So what tends to happen is that businesses start to feel pressure. You start ticking the boxes. Say, so is my supply chain digitized? Yes, it is. But why do you want to digitize the supplies? Why do you want to implement machine learning? You need to be very clear in terms of what we actually want to achieve um, when we are implementing this, these technologies. So what happened here is we were given direct instruction, you are building a data warehouse. You are going to automate your reporting. But what we phrased that problem a bit different, a bit more open-ended. And what if the client said to us, we need certain information at a certain point in time to make important business decisions. How do we do that? 
That's how you start at the problem and we investigate what solution is it that best solves this specific problem. The next key learning is, you know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And especially in our region, especially when I look at a lot of our businesses, a lot of our businesses were, it's, it's startups, it's, it's people that have been doing it for 30, 40 years. And the business technology and data process landscape is really immature. So we really need to consider where a business is at in terms of maturity, because we can't just jump from zero to hundred with one project. And that is kind of what we tried to do with this book. There was still too many processes driven by Excel, manual work, manual capturing app. And we tried to jump all the way to a full blown big data uh, reporting solution, business intelligence solution. But then we skipped a few steps in between. So understanding the business maturity in terms of where it currently is, you know, we can use that to, to build a digitization roadmap to say, and for that, yes, we need to have the head in the skies. Where do we want to be? What information do we want? You know, think about this whole, think about the end state and how shiny and how amazing it is. We need to have that in mind. But we need to. We need to have our feet on the ground as well, where we chunk it up into more achievable, smaller projects so that the end solution is actually sustainable and achievable. And then the last point, and this is probably the most difficult one, even for me, is that new technology requires new ways of thinking. And what I mean by that is that with new technology, with this technology revolution that's going on, we are able to do things that we previously couldn't, which means we need to challenge everything we thought we were certain of. In this specific case, I'm talking about how we measure our business. Now, maybe some KPIs were put together just because they were the only KPIs that could be, be, be measured but with the new data warehouse, we could measure them completely different. So with new technology, when we change the way we do things, we might also need to change the way, change the things we do. We can, it gives us an opportunity to completely revamp how our businesses work because we can, can achieve what we, what we couldn't um, previously do. So this project was a, uh, Back in the day, it was, it was seen as a success, but me looking back, I always feel like we could have done more. It was, it was, there was a lot of manual work and it was quite a, a slug to, to get this end solution to a, to a sustainable state. And you know, looking back, if, I, if I'd had these lessons and I, if, if I knew these things, I, I think I could have done a, done a better job of it. The next, project I want to present is the, the almost too good to be true. This is also a South African finished good storage and distribution business, uh, much larger than the previous one, um, with a very well-established WMA system implemented. Now, this project is, like I said earlier, it was, it was two of my colleagues that actually ran this project, and it's, it's the results are truly Truly incredible. So this, this client was a bit further along than the previous one. So they had a cloud infrastructure. They started to move into the cloud, uh, still a bit immature. They, they, they had some reporting in place, but still a bit you know, in the start phase, but, but moving in the right direction. And we actually got to this client with no intention of getting involved in any visibility or digitization project. This was a peer, peer consulting project where their warehouse was struggling to pick and ship all the required stock on a, on a, you know, on every ship. And it was, it was the case where they, they recently moved into a new warehouse, but it was the same staff, the same processes, but they just couldn't get there. You know, they, they couldn't get through all the volume. 
and we were almost dealt with this green fields open ended question go investigate the picking efficiency that was our brief and just to draw some of the draw from some of the conclusions of the previous um, case study is that that's already a step in the right direction because we started with the problem we didn't preempt a solution on this we were there's something wrong with picking efficiency let's let's go see how we can can make it better and we were also given the opportunity to pilot the solution whatever solution it is we, we came up with we um we were given the solution to pilot that this was such an interesting project because when we started speaking to the people on the ground we realized there were some very basic things missing the shift managers didn't know the exact number that they had to pick through during a shift they they knew how many truckloads they had to pick but they didn't know exactly how many cases needs to be picked and they had no way of tracking throughout a shift how well they are doing versus what they are supposed to be which which i think everybody can agree is is quite a quite an important piece of information for a shift manager to know another thing we found out is that pickers themselves never had any visibility of their current performance so they were picking going through their motions but they had no idea of knowing was am i doing a good job should i be moving fast or slower or, and they also had no idea of what the required volume is so they get to work put on their device and you know start picking so what we actually did and this doesn't sound very high tech but the results are very high tech is we we piloted the solution what we said was why don't we just give these these people this information on an hourly level without building anything fancy anything automated we built a very basic report uh, off of uh, just the extract from the wma system we actually extracted it to excel we hooked up a, a business intelligence tool to it and we built a single page report and all this report said was how much still out what is the outstanding pick how much do you still need to pick and then the pick rate per pick how many cases per hour is this person actually pick and we updated that report every hour completely manually downloaded the report copied and pasted it into excel press a refresh on a button so it wasn't a it was a pilot and um, and then for the next 6 weeks these two colleagues of mine altered and at the start and the end of each shift they would sit with the shift managers um where they normally have a toolbox talks where they just have a quick discussion with the pickers remind the guys of some safety protocols then we just used 5 to 10 minutes of that time just to go through the report and in these sessions what my colleagues did was they made sure that the people they were looking at the report and understand the numbers and i want to quickly pause on this we would never put an employee in front of a complicated piece of machinery and ask him to operate it without training but we do that with dashboards we do that with reports we put these extremely complicated reports and graphs and numbers in front of our employees and kind of go you know do something with it be useful and that is actually it's actually absurd so we spent those 6 weeks and going through with the employees making sure that they are data literate how to read data and graphs and to to understand what the report is actually communicating so that was the solution we did that for 6 weeks and the end result was that by by doing just that that the pick rate increased by 45% and that's why i call this case study the, the almost to be to be true because in other projects i have been involved with where we tried to increase the pick rate we had to make system changes warehouse layout changes then location changes and we get 5% maybe 10% increase in pick rate when we saw this number our first um our first thought was that the report was wrong we were making this mistake somewhere but actually what was happening 
because the pickers could see how much they need to pick, because the shift manager could manage how, could, could see where they are traveling versus what they need to do, he could motivate his employees. His employees understood that that's what I need to get done this shift. They had a clear target in mind and they started execute. And that is all we had need to do. Since then, this company has transitioned to a full-blown cloud-based data warehouse with automated reporting. It is honestly one of the best cloud-based data warehouses and reporting structures I've ever seen. Um, it really works. All their warehouses full of screens with the right information, showing it to the right people. And those people know what to do with the information that they're given. So if you can look at the, the, the key learnings from this case study, is that the technology itself is not the solution. It is an enabler. And that is very, very, very important to know, is that technology itself will not solve any problem. And I might be talking about two, in two absolute terms, and I know there will always be, in some case, technology is the absolute solution. But in our industry of supply chain, of I have a good friend that says, you know, supply chain and logistics is the exception. We deal with so many exceptions. Everything goes wrong. There's so much that can happen. I don't think the technology is sophisticated enough to, to be the solution, but it is sophisticated enough to enable us to make better decisions. So in this case, the technology didn't solve any problems. It just provided humans with the right information to make better decisions. And that is a very key takeaway when we talk about disruptive technologies. And we start asking ourselves, do the technology actually disrupt? Or they, do they just give us the power to disrupt? After this project, I've, I've adopted a question that I always ask at some point in time. I ask employee, if you can pick one thing, one piece of information, or you know, one, one piece of knowledge or one view, one graph that could make, help you make better decisions in your role, what would it be? Because that's the stuff we need to be focusing on. We need to, and, and this ties back to, to our previous learning where we need to focus on the problem. We need to focus on what is needed and then find the right solution to solve that problem and not the other way around. And the last point here is that people should still be at the center of our focus. If people are making decisions, we need to help them learn the new languages of technology. You know, data literacy, literacy and, and an employee's ability to understand and interpret the information that is given to him is literally the most important part of digitization. Because Great information without the ability to interpret means, means nothing. You, it's like 90% of the solution, but you can't get that last 10%. And the more the person understands the solution, the more likely that person is to adopt the solution. Because that's something that practically we see as well on the ground where a solution is implemented, but it doesn't actually make anybody's life easier. People resist against it because it's not fulfilling the function that it needs to in their life. So we spend months on months trying to force people to adapt this, adopt a certain technology or a certain way of doing things, but it never happens because they don't understand what it's supposed to be doing. No one has enabled them to be better at their jobs by using this technology. So in, in terms of results, this was, was one of the best projects I know of, you know, where, where the, the input was actually minimal versus the output that was extraordinary. There's really, you know, 45% increases. It's almost unheard of. And then the last case study, the trailblazer, um, is, is a project I'm really proud of. And it was, it was done with actually a very good friend of mine as well implementing some of your software. So the client was, was already quite mature. Um, it was a, a transporter and it was operating, you know, in, in Southern Africa, including Botswana and Namibia, Mozambique, a lot of cross-border trips. 
and also a lot of range of, of goods, dangerous goods, mining. Um, there was some FMCG. So there was a lot of different type of goods. It was really, it was a, it, it's a massive business. And they had really sophisticated tracking on their vehicles. They had amazing dash cams um, where this dash cam could determine if a vehicle is braking harshly or turning harshly, or it can, by looking at the, the whites of the driver's eyes, it could determine if, you know, the driver's looking on the road. So quite sophisticated in terms of the technology. It had a very sophisticated control tower with visibility on all the vehicles and what is happening in this vehicle. So every time a, a driver is driving more than 80 kilometers an hour, there'd be a notification in the control tower. The control tower would phone the driver and immediately say, listen, you need to slow down. So it was, it was as good as it gets in terms of what I've seen. Um, and I know that they've presented the solution in California, uh, you know, as a, as a world class solution. So this was, this was really an honor to be a part of. What we, we were still noticing though, is that there was still a lot of driver infringements happening. Although we were reactively managing them, so as they would happen, a driver would be contacted, listen, you're, you're harsh braking, or you are speeding, or you are cornering too quickly. Or we didn't see over time, the number of those events kind of just stay the same, which is, if, if we think about the end goal, we have all this technology, we have the devices that can measure all the events, we have this data warehouse where all the data comes in, we have the central control tower where, you know, we can manage them. But the, at, at, at the end of the day, it's still happening. Um, and our job was to, to kind of go, okay, but how do we close the loop? How do we use all of this amazing technology, uh, already very digitized, you know, business, but how do we use it to actually impact um, or reduce these number of events? And, the reason for doing so, I think, is quite obvious. You know, it's 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 a danger to the driver and a danger to, to all road users. And and funny enough, it also um, events like harsh cornering, mass braking puts a lot of strain on the vehicles. And with a fleet, I think they have more than three thousand vehicles. So your maintenance cost is actually significant, uh, believe it or not. So the outcome of this, we. From this, all this information we were gathering, we designed some reports that said, let's start looking at the, on a driver level, so at a specific driver, what is the infringements he was making there the most often? And the most interesting thing was that the same, we'd make the same kind of things more often. So if someone was tending to be speeding, you know, you, He'd always be or harsh braking or harsh corn. It's and that's almost easy to relate to because we all have driving habits in our own cars, and so the drivers have have driver habits as well. So we took this report and we said, okay, we made it the various depots' responsibilities to say, okay, it's your job to go take your top five worst performing drivers. So this is the guy with the most infringements. Sit with them, look at what events they were triggering the most. And we can actually give them training on how to reduce this, how to, to get better, to, to not infringe. Because sometimes it's, it was just about helping an individual understand that what the action and the reaction. If you do, if you corner too harshly, that's when this event triggers, that's why this is bad. This is how you should corner, this is the point that we need to have. So we did very focused training based on all this data we get, gathered. And the results were incredible. So over a three year period, there was a 42% increase in driver awareness. Now I know you might think, how do you measure driver awareness? Well, I was talking about that camera earlier and this camera monitors the whites of the eyes and also the size of the nostril. So the reason it monitors the size of the nostril because if a driver gets tired and his head tilts backward, the nostril size actually increases from the, from the canvas point of view, which triggers an alert. 
and it monitors the white of the eyes because as soon as you look down at your phone, for example, the whites in your eyes become less visible. So the camera knows you're actually not looking on the road. Um, so that, that's pretty cool tech that we're using. So, so that's how we could measure that. And a 45% decrease in safety infringements across all business units. And if, if we think about not only the monetary value of this, but the, the life value of this, you know, this is less accidents happening on the roads, um, less congestion. It, it is actually, it, I, I was extremely proud of you because this was for me really with digitization along with putting people first, understanding that people are the enablers um, with good solid processes shows how we can actually disrupt the way the, uh, the person works. And with this, I think this project kind of encapsulates the learning of the, of the um, previous two where, you know, start with the problem. Even though they had all this fancy tech, we really started with the peer problem and we use the tech to enable the solution, um, which is the next point. And then, and then also really focusing on helping people understand the solutions, helping people understand the technology and the information to be better at their jobs. Um, shoot, it looks like I ran for a while, about three minutes. But thank you, thank you for your time. And I really hope you, you found this, this insightful. I think Jakob will, will do some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Werner. Uh, I think it was great for us to see so many practical examples, I think, quite often with these kind of technologies and so forth, we hear about the airy fairy uh, future speak kind of things. And, and it's nice to see some, some more practical examples like I've mentioned. I think before we go to the exact, uh, we've had a couple of uh, Q, uh, questions in, in the chat box. So please go ahead. If you would like to ask some more, please go ahead. But before we go there, I think I just want to uh, highlight a couple of interesting results that we found from the polls. And I think, uh, uh, especially the first poll, you know, we asked which uh, technologies uh, are the most important, you know, and I'm going to quickly share it again. Uh, having the most significant impact on your business environment. And the results showed it was the Internet of Things, blockchain and AI. So perhaps, Werner, if you just want to quickly comment on, to, on those technologies and the possibility to implement them in our day-to-day -day base, basis doing, doing our business. 100%. So, you know, Internet of Things is, uh, I think this last, last case study really touched on that, is it's, it's absolutely incredible what is out there. I, I actually had a session with a, with a company last week we spoke about an Internet of Things platform and what they could measure. You know, for me, that's in the business of creating visibility. Internet of Things is really exciting because it's going to get to a point where there is no more blind spots um, in your entire supply chain. From, from production right until the end user uses it, we, we're going to be able to track that product. And the, the, the richness of that information, if we know what we want to do with it, is going to be amazing. And, and I want to still allude to that. I, I really think Internet of Things can, can change things from a, from a visibility perspective. But we need to be very certain of what it is we want to measure, why we want to measure it, and what we're going to do with that information. Um, the, the specific case study that the, the person that I had the meeting with was presenting me was, was the transportation of blood, actually. And it was so interesting where they could measure the temperature of those packets anywhere it was in that supply chain, which is, it, you don't need to be a genius to understand how that is beneficial. You know, that, that is product integrity, you know, from start to end. And what's so beautiful, it touches, on the, it touches on the blockchain, you know, where we have these technologies to create this decentralized um, record of all events that's taking place. So we, we really can trust what we see if, if you know, blockchain is something that uh, conceptually, uh, you know, the first time you read a formal definition of blockchain, 
it's almost difficult to to create a picture in your mind of actually how it works, but the the combination of blockchain and and internet of things is 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 amazing because we have this completely full data points, and we also have a way of knowing that they are true. Um, and knowing that they are true reflection and that each party has access to that simultaneous. Each party in the process has access to that simultaneous. Uh, that, I think that is, that is extremely valuable. I think that really also links to, to the third poll question that we run. And I'm quickly sharing the results once again. It, it, it speaks to connectivity. And I think in supply chain digitalization, that is, uh, it's such a key to have you know, connectivity towards uh, in, in terms of your business processes, in terms of your relationship with your various stakeholders and the like. And I just want to comment here before we go to the q and A. I I just want to comment also on your first case study. You mentioned Excel sheets. And I think all of the uh, attendees attending today uh, can, can speak to that. You know, it's taking those manual processes and, and to, to create, you know, some intelligence and i think that also speaks to the results of of the third poll questions that we ran and the most of the participants said that the most important technological upgrade needed uh, for customs and trade in our region is automated reporting and business intelligence so that really speaks to that uh, case study that you presented Absolutely. to us so Werner, if you allow me uh i quickly want to 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 go to the questions i think the, the first question I want to mention is uh, attendee asked that logistics is typically very data rich, but information mm. poor. And how do we change this? I'm going to start off with saying it is a very good question and also a very difficult question, but I'm going to give it my best shot because it's, it's something that I, I spend a lot of time thinking of as well. <clears throat> So I'm going to actually go back to that first case study and use it as, a, as, as an example. They had a WMS system implemented, but there were still processes and they were purely a, a, a warehousing company. It was what they do. They didn't own any of the stock that was in the warehouse. So they had a WMS system, but there were still processes being run on Excel. So the question comes to mind, why? Why does that, whatever process it was, why is that ability not encapsulated in the WMS, which has a front end that's data validation, <clears throat> so we can kind of link it all together. Why isn't it there? And the conclusion I, I, I got to was that, although I mentioned that some businesses aren't mature enough for the technology, there's also instances where the technology is mature enough for the business. And it's something we, we very rarely talk about. I believe that solution designers, people building the software, needs to work a lot closer to industry to understand what industry really needs so that we can build maybe a bit more robust um, software solutions. And and I think that really speaks to, we have all this abundance of information sitting, but it's so disjoint and it's not speaking to each other. So, so that's why, the, why it's so useful. Well, it's not useless, but it, it, it makes it much more difficult to, to get value out of that. Is that, uh, um, <clears throat> and I've, I think we, the way we are trying to address it is by, you know, the data centralization where we, we pull from the different sources and we try to link it and, we try to get good insights, but I don't think that is a sustainable solution. I think it's a, we need more sophisticated um, solutions to really facilitate the nitty gritty processes that every every company needs. It's very true, but, but I think that's it's uh, it's it's a difficult one. If, if I had the answer, you know, I'd be a lot richer. Um, I quickly want to go to the next question. Werner, if you allow me, and I think that it speaks also in part to the results we obtained from the poll questions. To say that, you know, uh, the technologies, the disruptive technologies, uh, the companies have been affected, either significantly or not 
significantly. But now, how do we change that? You know, as is the case in Africa, the uptake typically is, is of technology is, is slow and it's pretty low. So the question posed was, what is the most implementable for IR offering that can be used in the Eastern Southern Africa Regional uh, Customs Administration in the immediate term? So how can we uptake the technology right now, here today? I think you'll probably find my answer interesting is, I would, I, I would start with understanding what is needed first. Uh, I spoke about in the case that I, saw, I spoke about the, the digitization or the, the, the technology roadmap that a business need to do. And I think that's, that's your starting point is we, should, we shouldn't focus on the technology at all. We should focus on what our business needs and where, where, we, where our businesses are at this point in time and where we need them to be and what is the roadmap to get from, from A to B. Um, when we, we focus just on the technology, we, we are bound to make mistakes because our businesses aren't mature enough or we do not know what we want to do with the technology. So we're cramming this you know, triangle into the block shape and actually we just need the block. Um, that being said, out of my experience, I believe the very, very basic process and data capturing automation is, is probably where I see the most opportunity. And this is why I talk about these this low-code solutions currently, you know, on the Microsoft platform. The Power App is a good example where you can build a simple data capturing with some validation that links even to an Excel sheet, but just that Excel sheet can't be edited directly by humans. They have to interact with it through this one page low code application, which can be built extremely quickly. And it just, just ups your, your, your data quality a bit, you know, as a step one. And then as a step two, we go, okay, but that's not connected to Excel, that's connected to a SQL database. And after that, we connect to, uh, reporting so and after that we build automated reporting so as a as a start I, i'd probably say very basic process automation uh, automation and just something i want to add to that um before we go on is that machine learning and ai amazing tools but extremely data hungry and quality data hungry we can't start thinking of those kind of solutions before we really have high quality data and we can ensure that the data comes in of high quality. Otherwise, it's going to be a case of garbage in, garbage out. So for me, it's just about taking what we have, making sure it's really of, of a high quality and storing it in such a way that we can make it useful. You know, and then we, we, we take it from there based on the business needs. That's very true. That's very true. Werner, uh, I think our time is slowly running out. I just want a last comment from your side. And I'm quickly going to share the poll results of question six again. And these talk to the constraints that we currently have about, you know, implementing these technologies into our businesses, our associations, customs, and the like. So the most important is obviously knowledge, and know-how and then associated cost also with it. Just like the previous question I asked you, how do we go about changing that? How do we change and how do we increase the knowledge and decrease the cost simultaneously? Your final thoughts. Well, that's, uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting, those, those numbers, the know-how part is the fact that that's the highest. But it's so very true. We often don't know where to start. Um, and the cost of tools as well. You know, I think there's a, there's a, and it's not a misconception, is it, it, it holds some true that, you know, the cloud solutions are, are fairly expensive. But let's start with the learn know how. Um, how I see it, I'm essentially a consultant. And what I've learned over the years is that I don't really solve problems. I just, 
bring the right things together. So from an industry point of view, what I need from the industry is a really well-defined problem. I don't need a solution. I'll, I'll go fetch something and I'll add it. In. So from a know-how point of view is there's a lot of people, a lot of companies currently doing uh, free proof of concept where we go and we just explain. We just explain how it works and what it could be and the benefits we've seen. It takes a two, three hour session. We have a discussion. We say, this is what could be out there. We try to understand the business problem. This is what, you know, what it could look like. By also taking into account your appetite for cost. If you think about go buying a car, you can buy everything from a Ferrari to whatever a cheap car is, but it still drives on the road. And, and that holds true for, for digitization as well. There's the very shiny cloud-based reporting. It's quick and it's, it's amazing. It does cost money, but we have other solutions as well. You're not going to get all the benefit, but you can get some of it and it can be a start. So I think by addressing the cost and the know-how, it's about speaking to people that really, that specialize in this. You know, I myself and I, a lot of companies like ours specialize only in technology and what the technologies do so that when you tell me about a problem, I know which one to go select and say, okay, this is the right fit for you. Um, and that's where, and it kind of links to my previous comment where the solutions providers and the guys actually doing the work, we need to be working a lot closer together. I need to understand, you know, from an industry point of view, what is the stuff you're struggling with so that I can make sure the stuff I present to you is really relevant in solving your problems. Um, and, but you need, to, you, need, you need to tell me about it. And I need to be open to you about what is, what is available. So, so we need to collaborate a bit more, I believe, in, in what is the real problems and what is really available and how can we sustainably help each other to actually to actually go forward. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanna. I think for many of us today, uh, and myself included, certainly, is uh, technology is often this airy fairy speak. And we want to take that from the idea and the concepts and to implement it into our business. So, so we thank you for enlightening us so much on this topic. So I will hand Thanks. over to uh, Dr. Yunita Maria Arce to provide some concluding thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Jacob. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jakob and Werner. Yeah, it's uh, lovely to have young people around us and to, to help us to gain better understanding and insights. And uh, Werner, I'm going to take you up on your um, problem statement. So in the region, we don't have a trade facilitation index. We don't have, have accurate profile and screening of consignments in terms of a high, medium, and low risk. We have multiple stops at our border post, and we have 17 kilometer queues. And in that, supply chains are not made to handle any disruptions. So I'm not sure if I captured that correctly, but that is the problem statement in five uh, key concepts. So with that, colleagues, I want to say thank you very much for joining us. It was quite a nice event and uh, look forward to see you next time. So with that, I would say have a lovely, lovely Thursday afternoon and uh, we see you again on our next webinar. Thank you very much. And I'll officially close the session. <laughs>